Service, man. Great to see you guys today. I'm not sure what all God's doing in our midst, but I really like it, man. So it's an honor to be able to be able to worship Jesus and lift him up in this place, man. We've got a lot of things going on as a church. I mentioned earlier about our Sunday night activities, college age. We've got a meal for you after third service today, free meal. College ministry's putting that on. So if you're college age, if you want to stick around, go to church again like me, go to third service again, or go hang out in the coffee shop or do whatever you want to do. But in the end of third service, we're having a free meal over in the impact and then uh, college tonight at 7.30. Otherwise, if you got your Bible, open up to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, I know it's a little bit hard to find. Just look for all the T's. They're right together, long ones first. 1 Thessalonians. We're starting a series today called Imperfect. And the idea is behind it that God has a way of using imperfect people to do the most spectacular things. That God has a way of taking imperfect people and doing unbelievable things through them if that person is willing to do whatever Jesus wants them to do. In fact, he gets great glory out of using imperfect people. And that's really good news to me because I'm an imperfect person and I'm sure maybe you feel that way sometimes as well. God could never use me, but that's not true because God's the one that does it. He's just looking for somebody who's willing to do whatever he asks him to do. And so this is the idea behind this series, Imperfect, and uh, this, this uh, particular book, First Thessalonians. So the idea behind First Thessalonians, I want to kind of set the context today, is this. If you can imagine, just say that there's a village out there somewhere in the world, really a town, maybe the size of San Angelo, 100,000 people, and they never heard about Jesus before, never heard the name of Jesus, don't know anything about him, and say a missionary shows up and begins to proclaim the name of Jesus in that town, holds a crusade, holds a revival, you know, meets in the local um, area, gathering area, and just starts to proclaim Jesus. And, and uh, some of the people in that town give their lives to Jesus Christ, but, but because of certain events, this revivalist has to leave. This guy's only there for a short period of time, maybe a month, maybe a two month, and he has to leave and go to another town. And you don't have a Bible, you don't have the New Testament, you don't have anything. The question is, what would happen to that group of people? Would they kind of, you know, would they kind of flounder around and slowly get smaller? Would they grow? Would they make it? What if there was persecution? What would happen to that group of people? And what would happen if one of those people happened to be you? Would you stick with that or not? What would happen to that group of people? And this is the kind of the context of the book of First Thessalonians, that this missionary named Paul came in and planted a church, but through a series of events, he had to leave. And the question is, what happened to these people? So this is kind of the idea behind it. And uh, so I want to take a look at it today. I'm going to begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, all right? It begins like this. And as I read this, I want you just to look for these different things. Who wrote this book? Who was it written to? Is there any evidence that these people were believers in Jesus? And if so, why were they still following Jesus, all right? Because these are the questions that we need to answer in our own lives. So it goes like this, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sakes. You became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given you, given you by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, and not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, the entire chapter. Now, if you're in a small group, community life group, many of you are doing a study. It looks a little bit like this. It's on the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's a Bible study that uh, kind of goes along with our sermon series. And the reason we're doing something like this this time is uh, earlier this year, we did a series on Mark. And uh, my wife gave me one of these Bible studies on the book of Mark. And while I was preaching through it, I was doing this Bible study as well. 
And uh, almost every week, man, as I would study through the book of Mark, God would show me something just in my study time. And, and, and I know there's a lot of ways to get biblical knowledge. And if you're out there, you know, obviously you can listen to a sermon, you can listen to a podcast, you can read books, you can read commentaries, or you can do your own Bible study. And if you do your own Bible study and uh, you meditate and you think about the answers and you really try to figure it out yourself, there's a way that God has to speak directly to you. And whenever God says something directly to you, man, it just has a lot more weight. I mean, I can tell you something, but if God tells you something, you're going to remember it a lot more. And I don't know if God's ever said anything directly, but this is one of the ways God wants to speak to us is when we put in the work to study the Bible and uh, just do it. And so this is a real easy study. I mean, there's only four or five pages per week to do, seven weeks long. If you're in a community life group, chances are you'll be doing it. If you're not, I encourage you to get in a community life group. If you can't, maybe you just want to buy the book. They're five bucks. Get a couple of people. If you're a guy, just get a couple of people, have lunch once a week and go over your answers. Hold one another accountable to do study. Do it with your spouse. Ladies, get some ladies together. Just an opportunity to allow God to speak into your life about this particular book of First Thessalonians. So the story of First Thessalonians is, uh, is that God takes a group of imperfect people, all right? And this is what God wants to do in you. God wants to take you and do something through you beyond what you think you could ever do or have ever done. And if you're willing to surrender your life and allow him to work in there, God can do it because here's the thing. When it comes to spiritual things, God is the one that does it. God's the one that does it. And if God, like I say, if God speaks to you, it has a lot more meaning. If you can get to the point where God's the one that's doing it, right, this is where we want to get to. So the book of 1 Thessalonians, obviously, it's written by Paul, the apostle. It begins with his name, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And uh, Paul, the apostle, he began on what's known as the second missionary journey. He started off in Antioch, which is in modern-day Turkey. Silas was his traveling companion. They went back to visit some churches that established in the first missionary journey. They go to Derby. They go to a town called Lystra, and there they meet Timothy. And Timothy becomes one of their companions as well. So those three guys are going across modern-day Turkey. They want to go down to Asia, which is the southern part. And Scripture says that the spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them. So then they go a little bit further. They wanted to go to a place called Bithynia, which is a bunch of countries right up by the Black Sea, kind of up by Russia today. And it says that the Holy Spirit wouldn't allow them. So they just keep going west. They get all the way, you know, to the sea. And, and they have what's known as the Macedonian vision. They have this vision at night, Paul does, of this man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. So they get up the next morning. They all get together and say, hey, I think this is what God's calling us to do. So they get in a boat, they cross over, and they go into Macedonia, okay, which is significant. It's probably one of the biggest moves on Western civilization because Macedonia represented Europe. This is the gospel going to Europe for the first time. They come to a town called Philippi, hence the book of Philippians is written to the church there in Philippi. And the first person to get saved is a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. Then there's a little slave girl that gets saved after that. And because of that, this riot breaks out. And Paul and Silas, they get arrested. They get stripped, beaten, flogged, and thrown into prison, okay, for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they get put in the stocks. So if you can imagine having your back beat 40 times with a rod, and then you get stuck in a set of stocks with your feet, which means either if you're going to try to sleep, you have to lay flat on your back, which would be incredibly painful, or you have to lean over like this, which would be incredibly painful. It was just an additional way of torturing them while they were in jail. And so they're in jail for proclaiming the gospel in the book of Philippians. And it's recorded for us in Acts chapter 16, one of the more famous passages, Acts 16, verse 25, about midnight, about the darkest part of the night, Paul and Silas in prison were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Here in the midst of their trial and their suffering and their persecution, man, you got Paul and Silas and rather than sitting there in the corner crying, they're in there praising God and singing hymns and the other prisoners are listening to them. Who are these people and what is it about this Jesus that enables them to praise God even in the midst of the night, right? And it says, as they were praying, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken and all at once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Why is that, man? Because Jesus came to break every chain. 
and all the change on you. Man, there is power in the name of Jesus, all right? There's power in the proclamation of the gospel. There's power in the name of Jesus, and there's power if you can praise him in the dark when it don't look like it's going your way. In the midst of your trials, if you can lift up your eyes and put them on Jesus, right? There's power in that. And this earthquake comes along and sets everybody free. The jailer is going to kill himself because he thinks everybody's escaped. Paul's like, hey, bro, we're still here. We're not going anywhere. Turn on the lights. And this guy throws himself down at the feet of Jesus, recognizing, I mean, at the feet of Paul, recognizing something's going on. And he says, what must I do to be saved? What's it take for me to have what you have? And Paul responds to him, 1631, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your entire household, which that promise goes to you, by the way, this morning. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll be saved from the wrath to come, you and your entire household, and the jailer did that. He then takes them to his house. He binds up their wounds, you know, a little bit of a labor because of his faith, and then his entire household gets saved and gets baptized that very night. Now, if you're a Jewish guy like Paul the Apostle was, uh, he was a Pharisee, and there's actually a prayer that uh, every good Jew would pray. It's called their morning prayers, and it would go something like this, God, thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And uh, this was a bit of prayer that Paul had probably prayed his entire life before he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that I am not a Gentile. I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman, but God did something new in Paul. He writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, when it comes to Jesus, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He goes to Philippi, and the first person to get saved is a woman, and the second one to get saved is a slave, and the third one to get saved is a Gentile. Why is that? Because God is doing something new through Jesus. And God wants to do something new through you in Jesus. And God is doing something new through Paul in Philippi. And the next morning he gets released from jail and he has to leave. And so he travels about 50 miles, goes to a couple of other towns, but he comes to the town of Thessalonica. And the reason he goes there is because that's the capital city of Macedonia, the biggest town in the entire area, somewhere between 100 and 200,000 people, and they had never heard the name of Jesus. They were big enough to have a synagogue, so he goes into the synagogue, and for three weeks, he began to proclaim to them about the name of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ and how he was the Messiah out of the Old Testament and how he had to suffer just like Paul had suffered. He had to suffer and die, but he was resurrected from the dead. And it says in Acts 17, 4, that some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Gentiles. God-fearing means they had converted from, from paganism to being a, you know, a, to Judaism, and now they converted to Christianity and not a few prominent women. So a large number of God-fearing Greeks and not a few prominent women and a few Jews. But when that happened, the Jews in that city became jealous. They started a riot. And uh, because of that, Paul and Silas had to leave. They had to leave that night. And they went to an adjoining town about 50 miles away called Berea. So they had to leave this church. They go to Berea. They get to Berea. They go from there to Athens you know, the big city in Greece, and there all the philosophers got together. Paul preaches this sermon to the unknown God, and he leaves there. While he's in Athens, he takes Timothy, and he says, hey, dude, go back to Thessalonica and find out what happened to the church. He then leaves Athens, and he goes to Corinth, okay, the city of Corinth. And when he gets to Corinth, Paul, Paul frankly, needed a little encouragement. You ever need a little encouragement in your life? Like you're trying to serve God and do what God wants to do and you're trying to follow God and things just don't seem to be going the way you thought they would go. This is kind of Paul when he gets to Corinth. He says, man, I had this Macedonia vision. I came over to Philippi. I get beat up, flogged, thrown in jail. I go to Thessalonica. I have a riot. I get kicked out of town. I go to Athens and nobody will listen to me. And now I get to, to Corinth. And I just kind of wonder if this whole Jesus thing is going to work. I wonder if this, this whole thing is going to, going to work or or not, is it going to work for me? In fact, he records for us, and this comes from 1 Corinthians, 
the book of 1 Corinthians that he wrote to the church in Corinth, chapter 2. He says, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about our God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. It's like I, I tried to go toe-to-toe with those boys over there in Athens and use a little bit of these wise words of wisdom, and I got beat up pretty bad. So when I came to you, man, I, I didn't know if this thing was going to work or not. And I just resolved, man, just to preach Jesus to you guys. When I came to you, I came with weakness and fear and much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. You see, God was trying to teach Paul a lesson and, and he learned this lesson and it's the same lesson that all of us need to learn in this that when it comes to spiritual matters in your life in the life of a church you know we, we like to think that somehow we're the one that's pushing it forward that we are but down down deep we kind of hope that Jesus is and, and sometimes it's just good to realize that it's Jesus that's doing it and not us And when it comes to spiritual things, you progressing in your faith, people getting saved, people getting baptized, the church going forward, it's not really about us. It's really all about God and what he's done for us through Jesus. And and when we start to try to think that we've got something to do with it, we get in this same position as Paul. And he says, man, I just figured out I came to you. I got nothing except Jesus and him crucified and what he wants to do in your life, only he can do. And the same thing goes for you, man. If you want to progress spiritually, you better put it on Jesus and not yourself, right? And this is Paul, and he's in, in Corinth, but he's thinking about Thessalonica, like, hey, did it work? Did the gospel that I preached there work? Did it have any impact? Is this? But see, we ask this question sometimes, but really what we're really asking is, hey, w- would this work for me? Would this Jesus work for me? I mean, I know it worked for you, Kurt, or I know it worked for my Sunday school teacher, but will this Jesus thing work for me? If I really put it all on Jesus, will Jesus come through for me? And and I'm just going to tell you, man, the only way you'll ever know that is if you, by faith, put it all on Jesus. In, In other words, you'll never know if God can answer prayer or not unless you pray. I mean, you'll never really know if God can speak to you through his word unless you study his word. I mean, have you ever heard the expression, you can't outgive God? I always hear people say, oh, you can't outgive God. Hey, you'll never know if that's true or not until you give. I mean, you just, you gotta have faith, man. It's when you put faith. There was all these people that saw Jesus and never even saw him for who he was. They missed out on the whole thing why they didn't have any faith, right? Right? You'll just never know until you do it. You'll never really know an intimate relationship with Jesus and what he can really do for you until you surrender everything to him. And we can talk about being saved, and we can talk about Jesus, and we can talk about the Holy Spirit, but you'll never experience it until you personally say, man, I'm going to trust it all on Jesus. You'll never know the power of Jesus until you put yourself in in a position where you need it and you're willing to do whatever he asks you to do. This is just how God, it's just spiritual. So you can think about Paul's perspective. Here's Paul. He's on the road to Damascus. He's a Pharisee. He's a hates Christian. He's an enemy of God. Jesus shows up, knocks him off his horse. He has this experience where he sees the risen Lord in front of him, and God totally changes his life. Everything about his life changes. He says, man, I chose you, Paul, for a purpose. I want you to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And Paul's like, dude, will that even work? I mean, I know you changed my life, but can you use me to change somebody else's life? Will that even, what even, will that even work? And so he goes and and God says, hey, I want to go to Asia. No, I don't want you to go to Asia. Hey, I want to go to Bithynia. No, I don't want you to go. I want you to go to Macedonia. So he goes to Macedonia and he goes to Philippi. He gets beat up, thrown in prison, almost dies. He leaves there. He goes to Berea. He goes to Thessalonica. He gets kicked out. He goes to Athens. He gets all beat up. He limps into Corinth and he's like, dude, is any of this going to work or not? It's like what he really needs is just some encouragement that God can do what God says he's going to do. Now, I shared this earlier this spring in February. I went on a mission trip to Peru, 
And I know we just had a team get back from Peru, and it was kind of in the mountains. I went to the to the Amazon, and uh, this is the third year or fourth year in a row we've taken this trip. And, and we literally go to some villages, at least like a number of people never have heard the name of Jesus. And we went to this one particular village first night, and, uh, you know, we were all, we are going to have, a, you know, we were going to get everybody together in the village and tell them about Jesus. I was all geeked up about it. I was kind of like, when I start thinking about that, I start thinking about Billy Graham, man. Just give me a stadium, like 10,000, 100,000 people in there. I mean, there's only like 50 people in a village, so I had to scale that down a little bit, but still. You know, I'm going to preach, man. I'm going to get him here. I'm going to preach, you know. And we go, and it's hard to get to this village, man. I mean, you got to fly and drive and get on a boat for hours, and you get back. I mean, you're in the jungle, man. There's nothing there. It's one little village. And we get there, and it's kind of the rainy season, so, we, you know, things are the rivers up. But their whole village was flooded, and everything's built on stilts. Their houses, they kind of expect that. But they have this big soccer field kind of there, and normally you can go out there and play soccer on it. Well, it was like a foot underwater, and where we were going to stay was was it was still above water, but it was completely surrounded. So the only way you could get to where we were going to have our, you know, 100,000 people crusade was to have to wade through like a foot of stinky water in the mud. And so we were like, that's kind of disappointing. But still, hey, we're here. The Americans are here. I'm sure everybody will show up. We're going to meet at 7 o'clock. We all got there. We set all our chairs up. We're ready to go. And at 7 o'clock, there was five of us on their team. You know how many people were there? Five of us on our team. <laughs> I mean, that shouldn't be really so unusual, we said to ourselves, because there's only five people in the entire village that have a watch, and they're in this room, <laughs> you know, so you say 7 o'clock. I don't mean nothing to nobody except five Americans, all right? So we like, well, we wait an hour, still five. We wait two hours. We're all about to pass out from jet lag, still five of us. Well, finally, about two and a half hours in, you know, the people that were already believers in the village showed up. There's about five of them because they had to right? They kind of slug through the water and they get there and you're like, we're sorry nobody came, but nobody really wants to have to wade through the water at night. And, and, and you know what? We were disappointed. We were like, man, we came all this way. We're going to proclaim Jesus. And, and now nothing, man, you know? And we, we kind of tried to encourage ourselves, but we were all kind of disappointed. Then we got up the next day. I mean, we're only there for one day. We got up the next day and we leave. I'm like, gosh. And we go to this other village and we had, we'd been, had a team there a year before, and we get there, and if the first village was flooded, this one was three times as bad. It was like three feet deep, man. We, we rode our boat across their soccer field, and you couldn't even get to a house unless you were in a canoe, and it was like a ghost town around there, you know, and we're like, oh, man, and where we were going to have our thing that night was completely underwater. We're like, well, we can't stay. We'll just have to make a visit, and we stopped at this one house, and they didn't want to talk to us, but they said, I think there's a couple of people in that house down there on the end that were waiting on you guys. Because, I mean, they knew we were coming in that day, so we're like, okay. So we get back in our boat. We pull down there to this one house. We, we pull up and dock. We get out, and we're all kind of got bad attitudes about life. And, and we go in there, and we go in the house. There's like 15 people in this house. There's like three moms and a bunch of kids and a bunch of teenage boys, and they're all just standing in there, just standing around. And we're like, dude, what are you guys doing? They're like, dude, we're waiting on you. Like, you're waiting on us. What are you waiting on us for? Man, we're all, we all want to give our life to Jesus, and we're just waiting on you to get here to tell us how. We're like, what? And what had happened is the year before, this one lady had gotten saved. She was kind of like the matriarch of this whole family, and she got saved, and apparently when she got saved, she got the life in her. And so for a whole year, she'd been telling everybody, listen, all her kids, all her grandkids, everybody else, man, when those guys come back next year, you need to give your life to Jesus. This is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. So they were all waiting on us to get there because they wanted whatever she had, right? So we got nothing, and we show up, and all at once, God's like, here's 15. And everybody in the whole place, man, prayed to receive Christ. And then I had this guy walk up to me afterwards. He was kind of late. And I said to the interpreter, hey, ask this guy uh, if he wants to give his life to Christ. And, and so she does. And he goes, man, I really do. I've been waiting on this day. But don't tell me yet. Uh, can you come down to my house because I want to get my wife. So we pull down to his house. Time we get down there. He's down there. His wife's down there. His brother's down there. His wife's brother's down there. His dad's down there. His mom's down there. They're all waiting on us. Well, they want to get saved too. Now, who? how do we do it? Dude, that was just a God thing. Here's Paul. That's true, man. It was just a God thing. Here's Paul. Paul is in 
Corinth going, I wonder if this thing is going to work. They're waiting word from Timothy, and it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens, so we sent Timothy back to Thessalonica, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel, to strengthen and encourage you in the faith, and just to find out what was going on, because we really were afraid that the tempter had come in, and because of the persecution, you'd been tempted to go away from Jesus Christ, chapter 3, verse 6, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us how you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we are encouraged. We are encouraged about you because of your faith, for now we really live since you're standing firm in the Lord. Paul's like, dude, we were about to give up, but now, man, we're all fired up. We're really living now because of you guys. Man, your faith is in the Lord, and so they're all fired up. They write this book of 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, the church in Thessalonica, and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for you. Man, we're just sitting around going, is this incredible or what, man? We're thanking God for you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father, This is the evidence of their salvation, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're always giving thanks for you because we have evidence of your salvation, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by by hope. Paul begins, man, we thank God for you because this is the thing about the gospel. The gospel always begins with God. We thank God for you because we know if you're a believer in Jesus, it's because God did that. It's God who gives you grace. It's God who gives you love. You wouldn't be saved because God chose you. He goes on in verse 4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. How do we know that? Because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but with power and the Holy Spirit and with conviction. If you're a believer in Jesus, it's because God did that. Salvation always begins with God, number one. Number two, it always requires faith. In other words, it's not enough for you to know God. It's not enough for you even to have heard the gospel. The question is, have you ever accepted it by faith? Have you turned from your sin personally, by faith, trusted it all on Jesus? It requires faith. And here's the thing about, here's the thing about faith. Faith always produces fruit. If you truly have faith, there's always evidence of your faith. You are saved by grace, not works, but faith always works. It's the same, man. We were, we were all fired up when we heard about you, right? Because work, you know, work, you have work produced by faith. Faith always works. You know, when you get saved, man, things change. When you get saved, things change. If you know Jesus, you know change take off the old. You put on the new. You lay aside your old way of thinking. You lay aside your old way of talking. You lay aside your old way of spending your resources. You lay aside what you do on Sunday mornings. You get rid of the old and you put on the new because Jesus is here to change your life and he will change your life. And if you know Jesus, you'll know change. But if there is no change in your life, guess what? There's no Jesus because faith always Works. If you have living faith, it always produces works in you. Works produced by faith. If you say you have faith but have no change, man, your faith is dead. James 2, 2, 26, just as a spirit without the body is dead, so faith without works is dead, right? If you're going to hire somebody, if you're going to hire somebody to come to work for you, you know what you want? You want somebody to come do some work that will produce, that will bear fruit. This is what faith does. It always produces. We do not get saved by works, but our salvation produces works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Chapter 10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand. You don't get saved by works, but your faith always works. He says, man. Dude, we're fired up because we can see in your life work produced by faith and labor prompted by love. Love. Worldly love is always about what you can get. 
In other words, you're a young man, you see a young woman, you say, man, I love that woman. I wish she would come date me because that would make my life better, right? I love that woman. I wish she would marry me because that would make my life better. Worldly love is about what you can get. It's always conditional. You love me, I love you back. It's conditional. Godly love, agape love, is not based on what it can get, but what you can just give with nothing in expectation of return. It's just unconditional. I'm just going to love you whether you love me back. I'm going to love you whether you deserve to be loved or not. In fact, you do not deserve to be loved, but I'm going to love you anyway. Why? Just like God loved us, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, not because the world deserved it and not because all the world's going to accept it. God just gives it anyway. This is worldly love. Paul says, man, when I saw your labor inspired by love, prompted by love, I knew Jesus, the spirit of Jesus had to be in you because you don't love that way otherwise. You won't love that way otherwise. The only way you've got godly love is, you, is if God puts it in you. So when you start doing things for other people with nothing in expectation of return, just unconditionally loving other people, that's a sign that the spirit of Jesus actually lives in you. You know, it's, it's work produced by faith, labor prompted by love, endurance inspired by hope. Biblical hope is not just like, hey, I hope it, I hope it, hope it snows on Christmas. But this is based on the promises of God. If God's promised it, it's going to happen. I have hope that it's going to have the conviction that it's going to happen. And so the result of hope is the ability to remain steadfast in the midst of your trials. Why? Because God's got something better for you than a trial you're currently in. All right? So you can just think about this from, from God's perspective. Uh, what, think about what God had to do to get the gospel to Thessalonica. Right? I mean, he had to take this guy named Paul and get him out of Antioch all the way across modern-day Turkey by foot. Oh, I want to go down to Asia. I don't want you to go down to Asia. Hey, I want to go to Bethlehem. I don't want you to go to Bethlehem. Had to give him the Macedonia vision. Had to get him over to Philippi. Had to get him out of jail. Had to get him to Berea. Had to get him to Thessalonica. Just think of all the things that in the providence of God he had to do to get the gospel to Thessalonica. He did it because he loved him and he chose those people. Now, think about all the things God had to do to get the gospel to you. I mean, it's like God's up there going, man, I really want to reach the city of Thessalonica. I'm just looking for some dude that'll do the work. I'm just looking for some dude that'll do the work. I go down there and do some work produced by faith. I'm just looking for somebody that'll love them, right? I'm just looking for some, some that, would, that would do some labor prompted by love that would endure inspired by hope, that would be willing to get flogged and thrown in jail and beaten. I'm just looking for some dude that'll do some work down there and keep going, even though the going gets tough. And Paul says, I will do that. Why would Paul do that? And the reason Paul's willing to do that is because he knew that's exactly what Jesus Christ had done for him. Hey, I got some work for you, Jesus. I need you to leave heaven, go down to this earth and become a servant. And just go down there and love those people even though they don't deserve it. How much you want me to love them, God, all the way to the cross? And, and he endured it, right? He was inspired by hope. What was the hope? You know, Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and it's now at the right hand of God the Father. He put his hope on what was going to happen if he did it, and he endured the cross. Why? Out of love for you, he did the work. And now Paul sees the exact same thing in the church of Thessalonica. And he knew the spirit of Jesus must be in them. And it's the spirit of Jesus you see in you. Right? You got this labor of love, you know? You got this, this works produced by faith, this labor prompted by love, this endurance inspired by hope. And, and this hope, you see, becomes like an anchor what God has for you. We can, anything Jesus promised you, any promise of God is an anchor for you because if God promised it, see, it's going to come true. Jesus Christ is returning, by the way. He's coming back and he's bringing his reward with him for all those that labored in love, right? He's going to come. I did a survey the other day. How do you view your future? I said bright, as in it's going to be bright when Jesus Christ comes back, brother. You know what I mean? It's going to be glowing, man. And if you got that anchor, Okay? You can endure what you're going through right now. It becomes like an anchor for our soul, right? 
It's like Hebrews chapter 6, 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the intersanctuary behind the curtain. I heard Levi Lusco say one time, man, Jesus is our hope and hope's got a rope. An anchor's always attached to something, right? He said back in the day, we think of an anchor, they'd drop it off a boat to keep that boat where it's at. But back in the day when boats used you know, wind power, they would come into a harbor. They didn't have the ability to safely navigate, so they would stop, and a smaller boat would come. They'd put their anchor on the smaller boat. It would go ahead to where they were going to harbor and dock, drop the anchor, and then that boat would winch itself in until it got into a safe harbor. Guess what, man? You believe in Jesus, Jesus is your anchor. And you know where he's at? At the right hand of God the Father behind the veil in heaven right now, dude. And if you're a believer in Jesus through the Holy Spirit, hope's got a rope and you're connected to him. And every time you endure, every time you go through a difficult time, every time you go through a hard time, guess what, man? Every day you take, you keep your faith in Jesus. He's just inching you in, baby. Hey, I got something for you. I got an inheritance that cannot spoil or, or, or perish or fade away. At the right hand of God the Father, man, if you're in Christ, you're in Christ right now, man. It's completely safe. I'm pulling you in every day. Hope's got a rope, and Jesus is pulling you in, man, because Jesus always keeps his promises, right? And that's a hope that's sure and steadfast like an anchor launched in heaven, and it gives us the ability to endure even the difficult times we might find ourselves in. Amen. Let's pray.